I was reading the paper that a friend of mine is going to present at the, at the conference, the Middle East Association conference that's taking place in Boston this weekend. And uh, my friend Sebo Aslanian has, is writing his thesis. Uh, it's about Armenian traders in the 18th, 17th, 18th uh, centuries. And the chapter that is presented and I was reading, it was talking about the Armenian trading communities. And I'll mention some of the names and he lists these and he describes them. Manila, Tibet, Madras, Yejufa, of course. And Armenians, he had even found evidence that Armenians in the 17th and 18th centuries, 18th century, had established links with Mexico as well, in Acapulco. There was a lone Armenian in Acapulco at one point. And I was reading this thinking, I just met this Armenian in Banjul. You know, things continue, right? Things yeah. continue. It's a different process and uh, you know, a different century, but things continue. Now, the main trust of uh, my talk, and the main trust of the book, so the, the talk is obviously about the book. The main trust of this book is that there are many ways of being Armenian i.e. Armenian identity is not fixed, it's not a given, and is, it is not unchanging. So it is a changing, malleable identity. And it's constantly evolving, it's constantly changing, and it's being constructed. And I use the word constructed here, and it, sometimes Armenians don't like this word because it implies that you, know, you can actually build something out of Armenian identity, and I maintain that we do. And this has been the case historically, and that's what I want to talk about uh, a little bit. And it continues to be, uh, and it will continue in the 21st century. Now, you might say that this is an obvious point. We all know various Armenians who are very different from us. But the point is, goes counter to the nationalist thinking, which stipulates that there is a fixed way of being Armenian or any other national identity, uh, and that this is a given, given thing. So what the book does is it analyzes historically and comparatively, so it compares the diaspora and the homeland constantly, uh, between uh, how Armenian nation, national identity was shaped, by whom, when, and where. And this kind of systematic, comprehensive analysis of the construction or the evolution of Armenian, in Armenian, Armenian identity has not really been done before. So what I do is I sort of trace it historically from the prehistoric times up to about 1987-1988, i.e. just before the independence movement began in Armenia. The analytical framework that I use is based on theories of nationalism, uh, and I will not labor too much on this point. Uh, various schools of thought, modernist, constructivist, ethno-symbolist, primordialist, etc., etc. Um, and uh, I, I sort of go through this because you have to prove that you, know, you don't use theory. Uh, but what I do is that I use these theories to understand the Armenians, but also I use the Armenian case study to understand these theories as well. So it's a mutual thing. Armenians do have something to say about theories of nationalism and the theoretical debates around this. Those who are interested, if, uh, if people read the book uh, on the TV part, it's like the uh, second half of the first chapter, and you can very easily skip that uh, if you don't have stomach or academic discussions. Um, what I want to do uh, here uh, is not dwell too much on the historical parts of the book. Uh, I want to, to be a bit you know, presently focused and a bit forward-looking. Um, the title suggested that it's historical analysis for the 21st century. You know, as you know, we all Armenians love our history a bit too much, and we sometimes tend to get stuck in it, so I'm trying to get a bit, little bit out of doubt. But the one thing that I want to spend a couple of minutes on is this whole notion of multi-locality, multi-local uh, identity building. Now, this is the word that I use in the thesis and the publisher very rightfully, so said there is no way you put in that word in the title of a book. No one would buy it. I think they were right. But uh, in any case, I do want to spend a couple of minutes on this notion, and then I will focus more on the Soviet period, Armenian identity construction in the Soviet period, uh, how the Soviets did this, especially in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, and I will do sort of an analysis of the parallel process in the diaspora, how diaspora identity building uh, took place as well. Uh, and then I'll conclude with some, uh, uh, some thoughts about where things are now and where we're going. So the subtitle of the book is From Kings and Priests to Merchants and Commissars. I'm really sort of focusing on the commissars part of uh, the Soviet, Soviet period. Uh, very quick overview of, uh, of the construction of the book, of how it's, it's laid out after the first sort of theoretical uh, chapter, the introduction and whatnot. I start with the history of uh, story of my grandfather, by the way. Um, uh, and then uh, 
I, then I talk about the ancient history, the building blocks, how Armenians became Christian, how the alphabet was uh, invented, the Battle of Ararai, that it became a, a paradigm in Armenian thinking. I talk about Moses Horinazi, the, the uh, Batmahev, the Armenian historian who lived between the 5th and the 8th, 9th centuries, probably in the 5th, but we're not sure. For sure. We're not, uh, sure. I talk about the Turkic invasions, the Arab invasions, the Cilician uh, Kingdom. And then in the third chapter, I, I spend a lot of time about the Armenian merchants uh, in the in the 18th, 19th centuries. Armenian merchants who not only traded, but actually produced a lot of Armenian national uh, literature. The first Armenian political tract was published in Madras, India, for example, by a group of uh, merchants. Uh, of course, you cannot, uh, you cannot talk about Armenian identity without talking about the Mutitavis, the, the Catholic monks who played a tremendous role. Uh, I talk about Armenian printing. The first Armenian book was published in, 19, in 1512. That's uh, the tenth language in which uh, there was a publication 50 years after the printing press was invented by Gutenberg. Um, the work of the Mutitavis, the, again, coming up with the dictionary in 1749. Uh, Armenians had a dictionary before the English and the Germans, uh, thanks to the work of the Mukhitarist. Then I talk about the liberation attempts uh, in, the, in, in this period, Joseph Emin, David Beck, you know, some of you would know these uh, historical figures. Chapter 4 is about the multi-local Zaitung, the multi-local awakening. I'm going to talk about that a little bit, so I won't elaborate that. Of course, you cannot talk about Armenian politics without talking about or I mean ideally without talking about the role that the revolutionary parties played in the 19th century, the Dashnaks, the Rangabras, the, the Darbinagans, the Henchagians, uh, and what they did. The genocide uh, has a small section uh, in that. Um, and the last two chapters are the Soviet period. I look up at the Soviet period, how the Soviets did this. And again, throughout this, there's always half of it is on the diaspora, the other half is on, uh, on the Republic. Um, that's just a very quick overview of, of how it's structured. Now, the concept of multi-local that I want to convey to you uh, as sort of the, the central uh, argument in the book, it, it's a simple, simple idea. It's, a, it's saying that identity is being constructed not in one spot and in various different points in Armenian history, but it, explaining it is a very calm. It ex I like to explain it saying that it's a simple concept, but it's a very complicated process, how this was done. So basically, in the 18th and 19th centuries, when modern, Ar modern Armenian identity took shape, which doesn't mean Armenians did not exist before, obviously, but this modern sense of Armenianness, when this took shape, it did not happen in one spot. In a lot of European capitals, when this was happening, it was one place. The capital city was dictating its sense of being French, for example, in, in France, to the rest of the regions of France. In the Armenian case, because Armenians did not have a state, there was not one central spot. Uh, there were, by the 19th century, three different places. One was the western point, which was centered in Bolis, in, uh, in Istanbul, Constantinople, but also in, had elements in Venice, Vienna, and Paris. These were intellectual centers. The eastern point, which was based in Tiflis, Tbilisi, uh, but also Moscow, St. Petersburg, and Dorpat. And the central point, which was the Ottoman Vilayets, the Armenian Vilayets in the Ottoman Empire, and Russian Armenia uh, as well, to a lesser degree, Van, Erzerum, etc., etc. And what I argue is that three parallel processes of this reawakening, of this Zartong, was taking place, all of them parallel in order to create one nation. But there were profound differences in the way, the way they were conceptualizing things. In all cases, intellectuals were th rethinking the notion of collective identity, the question of who are we as a people, and they were changing it from a religious sense of belonging, i.e. with all part of the apostolic Armenian church, to a modern nation, which means that sovereignty rests with the people, i.e. to be legitimate collective, the people have to rule themselves. It had a political notion in it. Um, it did not necessarily mean independence, but it did mean that the community was this modern political community, not just a religious uh, collective. It had a cultural uh, project in this creating of a people. It's, it was based on language, religion, 
you know, the, as I said, and historical consciousness. Um, so in short, in this process, the we had to be relatively clear. For example, there were debates, vehement debates, in the, in the early part of the 19th century and in the 18th century, were Catholic Armenians Armenian. The Apostolic Church was said, no, once you, once you convert it, you were no longer part of the Armenian community. And of course, the intellectuals, the nationals were saying, no, this is not the case. So in the Armenian uh, uh, situation, there were di three different elements of this construction of, of the people. Yes, all were Armenians, but they had profound differences in their language, Eastern Armenian, Western Armenian, in their literature, and I sort of elaborate on these uh, uh, one by one, and in terms of political ideology. I don't have time to go into the details, but there were really profound differences in all this. And this, what I say, is that this multi-locality continues to this, uh, to this day. But how the Republic of Armenia today conceives of Armenianness is different how diasporans conceive themselves of Armenianness. And this was also the case in, in the Soviet period. Um, four important conclusions sort of emanate from, from this analysis is that a nation is not necessarily homogenous. Again, this goes counter to a lot of nationalist theory, but it's not necessarily homogenous. Like different people in different ways uh, become uh, Armenian differently. Uh, it emphasizes the subjective nature of all this, insofar as very different people could say we all belong to the same nation, so subjectivity. Uh, it questions the role of the state, that the states don't necessarily uh, have to be all that central in creating identity, our community structures play a role too. And finally, the importance of historical roots. So this is sort of a very brief overview of what I mean by, by multi-local. Uh, it's a thick chapter in the book, uh, and so the value reduced it to, to a couple of minutes. So let me skip a lot of, a lot of the work that I mentioned and just sort of focus on um, the post-genocide 20th century uh, Soviet-style na uh, national identity formation and again the parallel process that was taking place in the diaspora. Now, there were very two different, often oppositional, sources of Armenian identity formulation in much of the 20th century. One was emanating from uh, Yerevan, the other one uh, was in various diaspora communities, in the first instance Lebanon, and then uh, uh, also in, in France as well, and then the United States in terms of the lot of intellectual work that was taking place here. Um, in chapter six of the, of the book, I look at the structural factors that led to the strengthening of national identity in Soviet Armenia. This includes the setup of the Soviet Union. It was a federal uh, system. A lot of it was meant that it was federal, but nevertheless it had structures. The role of modernization, the policies that uh, Soviets had towards nationalities, the dem demographic issues, Armenia became really homogenous during the Soviet period. Um, the role of the political elite, uh, and the gap by the 1980s that had emerged between Soviet ideology and the reality on the ground. Again, these are things I'm mentioning uh, without elaborating on them because what I want to do in terms of my elaboration, taking 10 minutes or so, was uh, to look at how in fact, how in fact national identity was strengthened by the communists. So, it sounds contradictory, the communists strengthened national identity, but they in fact did. Let me start with a quote from um, Garen Demirjian, the first secretary of, of uh, Soviet Armenia until 1988. I uh, had the chance of interviewing him uh, in 1997 when I was doing my research in Armenia. Uh, it was a very interesting story how I managed to do that, but nevertheless, uh, we spent about an hour and he was telling me about his view of the world. Of, of, and so I asked him questions about how did the Soviets nationalize the republic. And this is what, this is what he said. And I'm quoting him. The communists first saved Armenia from guaranteed destruction in 1920. There's an element of truth there. They took it out of the mouth of the lion or the crocodile and saved it. And David Demijan really liked to use metaphors from the animal kingdom. <laughs> um, after they began, after the communists, they began to build it up. By the 1930s, the communist leadership of Armenia had already developed a sense of national identity and a drive for national development. Subsequent first secretaries and other leaders continued this as strengthened it. We prepared, now he's saying, we the communists, prepared the country for independence to be a strong republic. Hence, we did two things. 
we kept national identity unique. Yura had Kutun, so we kept identity as a unique Armenian thing, and we developed it further. And second, we built a strong economic base. We developed the country. This was very obvious in the 1960s. We had an army of 700,000 laborers. The population increased from 700,000 in 1920 to two and a half million. This was unprecedented, and then he finally concluded, I am very proud as first secretary that 20% of the history of Soviet Armenia belongs to me. <laughs> he did have an idea. Um, now, he's been extremely ostentatious, we know that. But he does have a point, and I sort of verified this in my interviews in Armenia. The, I kept asking about the Soviet role, and very few people basically disagreed the fact that the Soviets did build uh, Armenia and strengthened national identity. <laughs> So I was very curious as to how, how was this going on. So after the difficult years and the murderous years of Stalinism in the 1960s, a national renaissance took place, as was also being done in other Soviet republics, in Georgia uh, and whatnot. And in this, 1965 was an absolute turning point. Now, what happened in 1965? Uh, as many of you know, is it was the 50th anniversary of the genocide, and our Soviet Armenian authorities managed to get permission from Moscow to have a little small ceremony, official ceremony, uh, commemorating it. So the leaders of the, of the republic had gathered into, into the, uh, I think, the Alfred building at that point. But since what had happened um, is that 100,000 people, 100 to 200,000 people spontaneously gathered outside the center demanding our lands, our lands. And this, this was a very, first of all, in the Soviet Union, the spontaneous things did not take place. And second of all, 100,000 people demonstrating, or not against the regime, but demonstrating in the square where an official meeting was taking place was completely unprecedented. And everyone I interviewed, basically referred to 1965 as, an, as a turning point, and in the academic literature, uh, people do see 65 as an important uh, point. Um, a number of important legacies uh, emerge out of, out of this event. Um, the authorities, the Soviet authorities themselves began to sort of build the nation up, visibly, statues, this, that, the other thing. But it also propelled Soviet Armenia at the forefront of Armenian national and nationalistic issues. Until then, it was the Dashnaks in the diaspora who were basically waving the flag of, of uh, nationalism. After that, it became clear that in Soviet Armenia, there, were, there was a certain group of people that were pushing this national, or was seeing the world from this national perspective as well. They were not all believing communists, in other words. So that was the first thing. It put Soviet Armenia at the forefront. Second, Armenian nationalism never evolved into an anti-Soviet or anti-Russian direction. The Soviets sort of uh, made sure of that uh, because of their policies and because Armenia had Turkey to be against, uh, so that it was all channeled in an anti-Turkish di uh, direction, and it is nicely fitted into the Cold War policies of the, of the Soviet Union as well. And third, the 1965 demonstrations in Yerevan um, gave new meaning to, the, to genocide. It was elevated from being a personal and psychological level to a collective, official, and political uh, thing. So uh, after 1965, what happened? Uh, certain key factors and mechanisms emerged in the Soviet Republic, which, which led to the strengthening of, of identity. First, around the same time, there was a dissident movement that emerged in Armenia. Uh, in 1962-63, um, there was the affair of the seven. Some, some young men uh, started sort of thinking about national issues. They were arrested, uh, sent to prison and whatnot, but nevertheless, there were stealings of nationalist uh, mobilization uh, in the Republic. What were the issues at this point? They wanted, again, this is early 60s, they wanted the Armenian lands within the Soviet Union to be unified with Soviet Armenia, which meant Nakhichevan to be part of Armenia, Nagorno-Karabakh, Karabakh, Artsakh to be part of Armenia, uh, and Jabakh, the Armenian sort of uh, uh, the uh, enclave in, in Georgia. So this is what they demanded. Later on came issues of the genocide recognition uh, and uh, fear of Armenia's Russification. This dissident movement was crushed and then continued again, and some of you might know the name of Bayer Hayrigyan, who was uh, active in politics in the 1980s and 1990s. 
he emerged uh, in, that, in that period as well as a young man of 19 heading this movement. With the exception of Haileygia, no one was calling for the independence of Armenia, but they wanted to sort of issue, settle the land issue as they put it. Nothing came out of this in terms of mobilizing people, in terms of uh, having a huge following in Armenia, but it did keep the national, extreme nationalist sort of thinking alive uh, in Armenia, in Soviet Armenia, not only in the diaspora. Another important uh, element in, in what uh, the Soviets did was the whole writing of history, historiography. They wrote history, uh, Armenian intellectuals, wrote, wrote history often from a national perspective and tried to combine this national with the Soviet as well, and I'll sort of read some quotes later on. The quarterly Batma Panasiakan Hantes, the historical philological journal, was established in uh, 1958, which became a center for this kind of work and thinking. The history of the Armenian was History of the Armenian People was published from 67 to 84. This was an eight volume comprehensive history of the Armenian people. Um, I, edit, uh, I interviewed the, the chief editor who said that it was written with great national spirit, hugely <coughs> beneficial to the nation. Of course, now they're justifying things that they did in the Soviet Union from a national perspective in the 1990s, so that was easy to do, but nevertheless, there was this element. Um, in addition to this official historiography, which was becoming more and more national and nationalist, there was a parallel process which was unofficial, and there were like history clubs, which intellectuals gathered semi-privately to discuss issues of concern to, to the uh, people. Vaske Manugyan, again, a name that some of you might recognize as one of the uh, nationalist leaders in the 1980s, was quite active in this, uh, in this group as well. And very importantly also, there was a whole historiograf historiographical debate regarding the Bono Karabakh. Mm -hmm. And there was this, because they couldn't mobilize politically, they couldn't put this on the agenda, they did it in obscure history textbooks. And a lot of, some of it became really strange history. It was, you know, Armenians said, Karabakh belongs to Armenia because the people of Karabakh, the, the Caucasian Albanians, uh, were Armenian in the 8th century. Uh, AD and as Azerbaijani said, oh really, you know, they were Azerbaijani in the 8th century BC and it became to the point that people were arguing that the, the weirdest one that I read was in the 10,000 BC that, that there were Armenians in Karabakh, something like that. So, so some of it was not serious, but nevertheless you see, you see how uh, when people could not express themselves politically, publicly, they expressed themselves in, in such ways. Um, so what happened is that the past was politicized, manipulated, and at times created to fit the ideology that was simultaneously Soviet and, and nationalist. Um, and more often than that, history was seen as a weapon, or at least a tool through which national rights were to be defended, and this still continues to this day in, in Yerevan. Art and literature is, was another very important uh, element through which this national identity was really strengthened in the Soviet period. Um, the key themes that emerged uh, from this was the pride in Armenian history uh, and culture, the irredentism towards the lost lands in Turkey, i.e. demanding the Amman uh, Ararat and the lost lands, the need for unity, the beauty of Armenia, the beauty of the Armenian language, the praise of Soviet Armenia, as a national center for all Armenians, basically making the Soviet Republic as a national center, which was not really uh, the case. Um, Yerish Echarin sort of began this in the 1930s, but some of the famous poets that come to mind is Hovane Shiraz, um, who wrote this sort of national uh, uh, nationalist literature. Um, and Shiraz, along with many of the other writers, was playing on this very interesting ambiguity on the word Hyrenic, fatherland, right? Did it mean Armenia or did it mean the Soviet Union? It wasn't clear. They always played on this ambiguity. Um, so to the censors, they could say, hey, we're talking about the Soviet Union, how glorious it is. Uh, and, and sometimes it was very explicit that it wasn't the Soviet Union. Um, and this is very interesting, uh, you know, theme throughout Soviet Armenian literature. I'll just read one poem in translation that Shiraz wrote. Um, and it begins, if it had not taken us under its wings, our protector, the light of our eyes, the giant pillar of our back, the giant Russian pillar of our back, 
of peace, the victorious giant who was explaining, Oh my son, even if you learn a multitude of languages, do not forget your mother tongue. Russia never said that. But, so he's talking about the glorifying Russia. It fits into the pattern, right? So the censor is very pleased. And then it concludes, because names in each nation are its costume, its language, its eternal holiness, and it is the law of all humanity, whoever does not love that of his nation is the enemy of all nations. Right? So combining the universal Soviet with the Russian national, with also the Armenian um, national identity. Uh, Bayer Sevak went even further in terms of glorifying uh, the language. And in a poem he writes, he who calls you mother tongue is blissful, lucky is he who talks and judges through you. Not I, it is not I who masters you, you are, it is you, the language, who masters me. For and ever and always, uh, through you, you are glorified. Now this is sort of the linguistic glorification, but then other <coughs> poets like Joseph Emin, uh, not sorry, uh, Gevok Emin, Joseph Emin was in a different century, Gevok Emin. Uh, Gevok Emin, uh, in a poem called We, is explicitly basically through literature saying that the lost lands, i.e. you know, uh, Eastern Armenia belongs to, uh, to us. And he says, what are we after all? We and our land. Even if we try to mince the truth, we are tourists in our own land, guests in our own homes, a river with only one bank, i.e. the Arax River and Ahuyan, a mountain which we only view from afar, an unpeopled land, a landless people, and scattered beads which cannot be restrung. So he's really talking about the lost lands um, being viewed from Armenia. Uh, again, Silva Gabudikian uh, is in the same tradition as well, who passed away, uh, I think, last month. So through this lit literature, this whole national identity was being strengthened. And again, when we talk about Soviet literature, when a famous poet published a book, Within a week, 100,000 copies were sold, right? Everything was subsidized, books were cheap, so people bought it, and, and they had an appetite to read this. Uh, another element that emerged in, in, in uh, Soviet Armenia was the whole issue of language, the, ras the threat of Russification that a lot of inte intellectuals saw. Uh, it, it might seem strange to us now, but uh, Armenian nationals were seeing the Russification of Armenia as, as a threat, uh, but 25% of um, Armenian students in the 80s were going to Russian schools according to one source. So I'm not going to go on and on. I think you got the gist of the argument. Uh, just to say that in textbooks and education, education as well, this became very, very important. How textbooks are written is crucial in, in, in any nation. And I trace, for example, how the same story is told differently in the 1960s te textbook, in the 1970s textbook, and the 1990s textbook. Um, so. And again, you see the emergence of, of the national in all this. And each generation, the kids were growing up with a, with a different sort of uh, outlook. <laughs> monuments and rituals, there's a whole series of, of monuments that were being built. Uh, the church played an important role as well under the leadership of uh, the Catholicos. Uh, so again, a lot of, a lot of other uh, details that, that I will not go into. Now, importantly, by the 1980s, what had happened is that the whole ideology, the whole communist ideology had become a game. It had become a game that very few people, very few people believed in it, but they all sort of repeated it like parrots because they had to, and they knew that they had to in order to get away with other things. One of the most interesting uh, uh, interviews that I did was with the former censor of, of Armenia. And, and then I interviewed the intellectuals whom he censored. So you would think that the intellectuals had grudges or didn't like this guy. And then it emerged that there was a game between them. It's like, okay, you give me this much, I can censor this much, but I let through this much, right? And small republics, people know, people know one another. And all was sort of the whole thing was, uh, you know, keep Moscow happy, pull the wool over their eyes if you can, and do your own thing. So it had, become, it had become this game, and you know, you, you hear one person saying this, and you collaborate with others, and it emerges that you know, there's this sort of network. Uh, even the first secretary, the Amirjan, talked about the censor in positive terms, that you know, he, didn't, he wanted to quit because he couldn't do his job, so he said, I encourage him to stay and try to, he didn't use the words, but basically fool Moscow as much as you could. <laughs> um, Moscow wasn't that easily fooled, they had other ways of 
of finding out which which they used. Yeah. Um, now, to conclude to conclude this section, and I only have about ten more minutes, uh, ten twelve more minutes, I think. Yeah. So, uh, to conclude this section, the Soviet Armenian identity that was being created uh, was different. It was different and was even foreign to the diaspora in Armenia at this point. Many, many in the diaspora would argue, uh, would agree with the whole notion that Soviet rule was in, important and necessary for security reasons, but not much more than that. The diaspora did not and still does not see the world, human relations, you know, rights and responsibilities, culture, social and political identity from that all too persuasive but uh, pervasive, all, all, all the pervasive and not difficult to define Soviet perspective. The Soviet Armenians did nationalize their republic in their own way, but they could not make their vision of what is meant, what is to be an Armenian, an Armenian-speaking, Armenian residing, Russian-oriented collective. They could not make their vision the pan-Armenian ideal. Um, in short, they could sort of, for half of the people, or half of the nation, they could create a vision of being Armenian, and the <coughs> other half was a diaspora, had to do its own thing. So in the last 10 minutes, I'll just turn to the diaspora uh, part of my argument. Yeah. In the diaspora, there was, an, there was a parallel process of, uh, of nationalization. It was a bit more difficult because there was no central state, because there was no government, there were various communities, and also because the people in the diaspora, the post-genocide survivors, were a very diverse group of people. And, and we forget that in the 1920s, they, most of them did not even speak Armenian. They spoke Turkish and local dialects. And you know, it was a community in trauma. So what was going on in the Soviet Armenia was Soviet-style nation building. <coughs> in the diaspora, there was diaspora-style na nation building. And here I focus a lot on Lebanon, because Lebanon was the central sort of intellectual center, center at this point. Um, and of course, I make uh, all sorts of qualifications and, and allowances for North America and Europe, which I'll get to. Now, this, this was the classic elite mobilization effort, uh, efforts to create a conscious nation, except if Stalin and Russification were the main threats in Soviet Armenia, Parochialism, i.e. being more loyal to your village than to the nation, <coughs> and voluntary assimilation were the main threats in the diaspora. Nonetheless, under the leadership of uh, competing organizations, a heterogeneous group of people with fundamental differences, uh, be it in terms of uh, uh, their regional identity, in terms of their religion, apostolic, Catholic, Protestants, in terms of language, Armenian, Turkish dialects, in terms of their occupation and class, social status, some were assimilated uh, elites, others were refugees, very diverse political loyalties and cultural influences from whole states. This is great mix of people were molded into a relatively homogenized community with a collective consciousness as a diasporic nation. And I get nervous talking about diasporic nation because Khachik Tolodian just walked in earlier and is the big expert on this. <laughs> um, in short, Armenianness as the most important identity category was either created or reinforced in the diaspora, superseding the differences within uh, the various communities which lived abroad. Similar to what the Bolsheviks were doing in the Soviet Union, the Dashnaks, the ARF, and other diaspora political parties embarked on a program of mass mobilization using the youth uh, of the Armenian-speaking refugees as a core group of supporters. And the Dashnaks were very conscious of this. Right? The Dashnaks did, did this, and they wrote about it in their newspapers in the 1930s, what they inherited and what they tried to do. So for example, an intensive propaganda campaign was launched in Lebanon, the root of many of the diaspora communities, to propagate the party's nationalist ideals and its socialist goals, and to instill national spirit and culture, according to Shah Gaudian, one of the scholars who works on this. Ultimately, the campaign grew, uh, bore fruit, and a new generation of Armenians grew up speaking the language and identity, uh, and identifying with the nation above all else. And this was essentially the emergence of a modern sense of uh, uh, common ethnic consciousness. Now, how did the diaspora do this? They had three uh, main elements, education, 
language and nationalist ideology, i.e. political ideology. Again, this is parallel to what's going on in the Soviet Union. In terms of education, secular community schools were established, which were controlled by the parties, uh, something that could be done in the Middle East, obviously, but not in Europe and America, in, in the United States. So education, in terms of language, Western Armenian, except in Iran, was used as a signif signifier of new national identity rather than the church. So it was a conscious decision. Armenians should identify themselves as Armenian based on speaking Armenian and not being uh, part of the apostolic church. Uh, local dialects were condemned as parochial, and the use of Turkish was vehemently denounced. So in my own case, from a grandfather who spoke six languages, to me, who was growing up in Lebanon, learning one property. Um, and it's an interesting story how my grandfather came to learn six languages, and I'll tell you maybe that later. Now, for the communities in uh, Europe and North America, the linguistic cha challenge was a lot tougher, as, as we all know. Acculturation into the mainstream society was much more rapid due to the pressures from host society, the whole Americanization, for example, Americanization League, for example, here, and the more fluid borders between the Armenian community and the host society. So consequently, Armenian communities in the West could not use language as an identity marker to the same degree as in the Middle East, and this led to a serious division within the Western diaspora regarding the relationship between language and identity. Was knowing the Armenian language so important to being Armenian, um, it was asked. In such communities, the apostolic church, as controlled by the lay community leadership and the political parties, acquired the same function as language did in the Middle East. Not that I'm saying Armenians did not go to church in the Middle East, but we're talking about different sort of pillars of identity. Now, in addition to education and uh, language, there was a very clear nationalist ideology that became the third component of, of diaspora Armenian identity. Despite the divisions between, between uh, Dashnaks and, and uh, Henchaks and Rangavas regarding Soviet Armenia, being for it or against it, all, all diaspora organizations in the 1920s uh, onwards were in agreement to what constituted an ideal Armenian. We're talking about, quote unquote, an ideal Armenian. As I mentioned, language was the key. Then came knowledge of and pride in history. So history was taught very you know, extensively in Armenian schools. There was third, a commitment to the Armenian cause, which included the liberation of the lost lands in Turkey in the case of the Dashnaks, and in the case of the Dashnaks, liberation from Soviet yoke. Fourth, there was a central notion of return to the homeland, which was an important part of Armenian ideology that we all ought to go back to Western Armenia and this diaspora existence is temporary. The fifth was activism or participation in community organizations. A good Armenian had to be active. Membership of the Armenian Apostolic Church remained important as a sixth element. Eventually, grudgingly, they accepted Armenian Catholics and Protestants as legitimate too. Um, Belief in socialism, loosely defined in the case of the uh, Hanchaks and the, and the Dashnaks, and liberalism in the case of the Ramgavras, and eight, very importantly, there was a strong element of anti-Turkishness in this ideology. And these ideas were propagated throughout the community in formal and informal manners until they were internalized as the norm. Now, between the 1920s and 60s, 1960s, Soviet Armenia and the diaspora did not influence. They did not influence each other's nation-building process all that much. There was some, in the 60s onwards, there was some contact among intellectuals, but earlier on, not that much. There was not much interaction or dialogue, but polarity, competition, and propaganda. Uh, whatever contacts there were, it was between the Soviet regime and its allies abroad, uh, obviously. Um, the latter were not ideologically anti-nationalist, and they posed neither an alternative nor a threat to the overall diaspora nation-building process. Now, things started to change in the 19, 1980s in the diaspora, and a new diaspora identity emerged, and a new diaspora politics emerged. And this is the more sort of the hybrid, the hybrid uh, diaspora identity that we all face today. Do I have another five minutes? We'll yep, okay, time. all right. I don't want to put people to sleep immediately after lunch, you know. <laughs> I have the benefit of having a bit of coffee left, so... Okay, so a few words about, about the emergence of a new diaspora identity. And, and you see this in your children and your grandchildren, so I'm basically, in some ways, describing the obvious to you, but uh, in, 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 
sort of in an intellectual tradition uh, that is in diaspora studies or nationals and studies. Um, now, national identity, as I have been maintaining, like all social identities, especially in a diasporan setting, is susceptible to many, many influences. It is not static, it's changing. Now, whereas in the Middle East, Armenian identity generally remained in the traditional mold of the 1920s, so what it meant to be Armenian, as I described in the 1920s, was still maintained to be Armenian in the 1970s and 80s. In the West, let's focus on the United States, in the West, but also to Europe, in Europe to some degree, it evolved in a new direction, which questioned the norms set decades earlier, and I already mentioned language. By the last quarter of the 20th century, and currently, and I think in the foreseeable future, some of the more numerous North American and European communities evolved into centers of identity formulation in their own right. It was, this identity was reformulated in ways which would not fit into the image of their earlier nationalist uh, thinking. In this identity, objective factors, quote-unquote objective factors such as language, such as traditional cultural markers, such as establishing community organizations and politics or the church, and especially the idea of returning to the homeland, these notions were no longer central, but feeling Armenian was. And Ani Bakari, as some of you know, has worked on this and has used the term symbolic ethnicity to describe this. It's a much looser notion of being Armenian, in, and it emerged out of this open environment and open social setting in the West. Hence, the very meaning of Armenianness began to change, and it is changing, and it is being remo remolded into an identity far removed from its original conception. Importantly, the notion of homeland, and especially the idea of return, is no longer central to this identity. Homeland has become culturally foreign, an emotionally remote concept for most diaspora Armenians in the West. I don't say all, I say most. In host society, uh, and the host society, conversely has become a home as the boundaries around which, around the community and, and the whole society erode. Now, traditional uh, thinking is that what's happening is Armenians are similarly. They're withering away. No, true, some elements are, and some elements are withering away. But what I'm arguing is that it, instead of thinking it this way as Armenians are similarly, we can also think of it as Armenians are developing into a unique entity based on a hybrid, and hyphenated identity of and dual loyalties. In short, parts of the diaspora, especially in the West, are evolving into a conscious body in its own right, based on a subjective feeling of being Armenian and American or British or French here and now. Now, this leads to the possibility that members of one nation could have more than one homeland, i.e. more than one root national identity and more than one way of belonging. A diaspora in Armenian's homeland can alternate between, or simultaneously be, the host land, where he or she lives, you know, homeland is America, the homeland, emphasis on land, i.e. the ancestral territory, Kharpet, Van, uh, whatever, or the diaspora condition itself as homeland, emphasis on home, in which saying, I'm a diaspora in Armenian, I don't really belong anywhere, but I'm Armenian nonetheless. So, again, Think of my friend in Manchu who's saying that he's Armenian, very proud of it, but he doesn't have a community, he's the only one there, but still identifies to this notion of Armenianness. Um, more specifically, by not having the idea of a homeland fixed in one spot, for a typical diaspora Armenian in the West, the homeland could mean, as I said, the ancestral village in the Ottoman Empire, the city of birth in the Middle East. Some people still refer to you know, where they were born in the Middle East as home, and the country of residency or citizenship. But also very importantly, is recently in the last 10 years, the whole notion of Armenia itself, current independent Armenia being the homeland, or the ideal of a homeland, has emerged as well. And this is something that Armenian authorities in Yerevan are trying to really push, uh, that everyone's homeland is, is the republic. Some people agree with this, some, uh, some do not. Now, despite such profound divisions, uh, differences in competing identities, a sense of belonging to the same nation continues, of being or feeling Armenian, and the thread which connects the various diaspora communities as well as the, dias uh, the, the as well as the diaspora as a whole with the, with the republic, is this notion of 
subjectively we all say we are Armenian. And we sort of very easily gloss over differences. And this is absolutely important, and it's a central point of the book, is that the subjective sense of belonging has to be there despite the differences. Now to conclude, I'll just sort of go over with the conclusion of the book. And I decided not to sort of wrap things up altogether in, in the conclusion, and I did it in two pages. But I decided to tell four stories which demonstrate for now and in the foreseeable future of where Armenian identity is going. And the four stories are things that I observed myself. Two of them are from Armenia, two of them are from the diaspora. One of them is um, something that happened as I took a drive with a friend of mine in Armenia from Yerevan to Leninagan to Gumri. And we were driving right by the Turkish border and we had his 15-year-old son born and raised and goes to school in Armenia. And these are the questions that the 15-year-old son asked. Where is Mount Ararat? Is it in Armenia or in Turkey? What is Ani? Not where. What is Ani? The famous uh, medieval city. City. What religion are the Turks? What is a mosque? Uh, and so forth. You can tell that in present day <coughs> Armenia, 15-year-old bo boy, that we all know where Mount Ararat is. We all know, know what Ani is. He had no clue. He didn't care. He's part of the new generation of Armenians. And so you have this, but you know, there's no doubt absolutely in his mind that he's, not, he's Armenian, right? Mm -hmm. Now contrast this to a group of intellectuals that I met and, and uh, interviewed in Armenia, the Tseradruns, uh, loosely translated, those who worship uh, the race. Um, and their vision is that, uh, their, their vision is that, uh, as, as one of them put it to me, humanity is divided into nations. Each nation is unique and has its own specific characteristics, such as language, cultural traits, family values, territory, etc. Classic national thinking, nationalist thinking. This must be kept and perpetuated in an unadulterated form without the influence of other values and races. The purity concept, we never change, this is identity given. And the national blood must stay pure, and they're really talking about blood, blood. they're talking about genetics. Hence, mixed marriages and cultural hybridity are not acceptable. The onslaught of the West must be rejected. For example, Western concepts such as human rights, feminism, are foreign to Armenian values. It must be opposed, etc., etc. Um, now, this is the other extreme, right? From the 15-year-old who doesn't know what Ararat or where Ararat is, uh, to these. Think about it in the diaspora as well, not just Armenia. Some of you might have heard of System of a Down, right? Uh, heavy metal band singing about genocide. Um, now, what would the Tzerag one say about heavy metal band and singing of genocide? You know, who knows? Uh, but you see different ways of being Armenian. And the last story is an ad that I saw in the California newspapers about, completely fantastic, but um, a talk in California and this is the ad, and I'll read parts of it. You have heard that Armenia's mountain range is considered the biblical place of Eden, right? And according to new research, Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh, is the garden of Eden. Who were Adam and Eve? There is no answer. The assumption is that they were Armenian. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> what scientific factors are there providing, proving the story of Noah's Ark is based on real geological changes, okay? Why is Armenia considered the cradle of Aryan peoples from where interna international civilizations have spread? What proofs, irrefutable proofs, excuse me, are there that the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Bavarians of Germany, the Basques, and the coast of Albanians have all migrated from Artsakh, etc., etc. <laughs> now, this, this is in the diaspora, this is in California. Um, what is California diaspora? Maybe it's homeland. So, um, so, these people and the Tzerad ones in Armenia would, would get along very well with one another, right? So, uh, so what I'm trying to say in all this is that here today, you know, there are four very different groups of people all saying they are Armenian, very different ways of uh, having, a, you know, meanings and beliefs that are very different one another. The teenager with no national concerns, the ultra-nationalists who worship the race, the members of the heavy metal band uh, singing about genocide, um, and the educational event as I, as I read. There are not too many things or objective markers tying them together, 
But this condition is not new. Merchants, monks, peasants, and revolutionaries in the 18th, 19th centuries didn't have anything in common either, except the, you know, this notion of being Armenian. And again, I come back to my argument of the subjective sense of, sense of belonging. Where are we now? We're facing new challenges as, as a people, a newly independent <coughs> republic, which is weak, but claiming to be the center of uh, Armenian culture and politics. Diaspora communities, which have shifted uh, from their center being in the Middle East to, to being in the uh, uh, United States and lesser degree Europe. And very, very importantly, a diaspora that is emerging, about which we know hardly anything, and that's a new Armenian diaspora in Russia. Uh, a million, million and a half, some say up to two million Armenians living in Russia. So this debate, who is an Armenian, how is Armenian identity constructed, will, will continue. will continue for centuries ahead. Who knows, 200 years down the road, there might be Armenians which we will not recognize. Certainly, if uh, an Armenian was resurrected from Anatolia in the, 19, uh, in the 18th century, we would not recognize any of us as Armenian. So, but the tradition continues, and it evolves in a multi-local manner, and uh, it evolves as long as there are enough Armenians who say they're Armenian, and they're willing to forget the difference differences between them. Thank you. I have some questions for Dr. Fanosian. Please raise your hands. Eric? Dr. where do you see us going? We heard a lot about the past, but where do you visualize what's going to happen? Uh, I'm glad I brought my crystal ball with me. <laughs> um, where are we going? I think I think we're going in a, well, I'm not terribly optimistic in terms of Armenia. Um, and this is contrary to the, to the main, mainstream thinking. Uh, people say it's a republic, it's independent, etc., etc. I'm very worried in terms of the republic, the structural basis on which it's being founded economically, predominantly, socially, and politically as well, uh, are not sustainable in the long run. Uh, so I'm concerned there. In the diaspora, Again, this is counterintuitive, well, not counterintuitive, it's counter to the mainstream thinking. In the diaspora, I'm more optimistic. In the diaspora, because, yes, people say Armenians in Poland assimilated. Yes, I know. Uh, Armenians here and they're assimilated. But diaspora as a whole continue. But this is the strength. This multi locality is the strength of the Armenian nation as a whole because when one sec part disappears, another part emerges and continues the torch, so to speak. And I think what is going to happen in the 50 years down the road is that we might see certain significant but small communities in North America, some are assimilated, but still a core of strong like, like people around this table, uh, who are maintaining sort of the traditions uh, in terms of, not, not the old traditions, but the whole notion of Armenian. But I also see a very strong community, which would be very different from, from us as Western Armenians, emerging in Russia. And the Russian Armenian community will probably assimilate, a good part of them will assimilate, it's very easy. But a, a strong element will continue, and I think the shift of the diaspora center will probably shift to Eastern Europe, Russia, in the next 50 years or so. That's sort of the crystal ball prediction I would make, which you cannot prove me right or wrong. So, <laughs> so we, you know, that's the. I think, I think that's sort of the direction I see as as a people going. Um, and about Armenia, I can, I can tell you later as well. Are you allowed to ask the question? I am. <laughs> Uh, I'll ask this one because I know it's something you've talked about in the, in the book. You, you talk about the idea of national Armenian national identity in, the, in, the pre, in a pre-nation state era because as you know, mm -hmm. of course, there's some people say, you know, that let's just say Bartok Magonia had this sense of Armenian national identity or if you want to go back to mm -hmm. Hi. Adam and Eve or yeah. pick the uh, ancestor yeah. of your choice. Uh, if you could talk about that a little bit, <laughs> and the distinction you would make. Right. Um, Mark's question boils down to a very sort of uh, problematic area in, in nationalist uh, uh, academic studies. And that is how you do, how do you define the nation and how far, how far back you project it. Uh, some people say Armenians, Jews, and other ancient peoples have existed as a nation for you know, thousands of years. In the case of the Armenians, we have reference, the first reference is in 512 BC, I think, or 5 something BC. And therefore, there was an Armenian a nation. What I'm arguing is saying that 
No, there were an Armenian people. There was an ethnic community, there was a religious community, there was a people with their own leadership that were Armenian, we can call them Armenian, but we cannot call them a nation because a nation is something thoroughly modern. The whole concept of nation is a modern uh, idea. And it is a modern idea because in a nation, the way we define nation uh, is that the people have sovereignty, i.e., in order to have a political community to be legitimate, the people have to rule it. They have to be elected or whatever, the people have to rule it. This is a very modern concept. It, you know, if you want to put your finger on one historic moment, it's the French Revolution in 1789. Um, I argue that this whole notion of nationalism is a, is a modern notion, but it cannot exist, uh, or it could exist, but it is not meaningful unless we have historical roots. And what makes the Armenian case very unique and very powerful is the fact that you do have this ancient history which was brought into the construction of a modern uh, national identity and that produced a modern nation. And so it's really a definitional issue in terms of nationalism studies. So I'm very happy to call them an ethnic community, a proto-nation, uh, in, in academic literature it's called an ethne, um, and I have, you know, some people confuse it, saying by modern you mean Armenians did not exist before. No, that's not the case at all. But the political sense of nationalism is a, is a modern ideology, and therefore we cannot talk about something modern in the mod pre modern era. Right. Thank you for your talk, um, My question deals with the uh, Stalinist period. And uh, in your opinion, what, why do you think um, Armenian nationalism survived the and the repression of the 30s. Um, was it because World War II maybe came soon after and Stalin sort of loosened mm -hmm. up on the nationalist issue? Or was it because the Armenian sense of nationalism was so strong that it stood a very repressive uh, period? It's a bit of both. It's a bit of both. If Stalinism probably had continued for another 50 years, let's say in that vein, probably he could have destroyed that, you know, uh, eliminated na nationalism or national identity. But uh, a couple of things happened. First of all, as repressive uh, as Stalin was, as uh, you know, murderous as he was, he never fundamentally undermined the Soviet federal structure, which stipulated that peoples had the right to their own republic if they met certain criteria. So basically, in his and he's written about this, right? He's, he was a commissar of national reserve. So basically. Even under the Stalin constitution and uh, Stalin's thinking is that nationalism is bad, but the way we sort of formulate the Soviet Union is based on national republics, which meant that there was an Armenian Soviet Socialist Republic with its own structures, its own Soviet, its own uh, uh, legal system, etc., etc. Theoretically not independent, theoretically autonomous, in reality completely ruled by Moscow at this point. So there was a structural basis. The second thing is the evolution uh, of what happened, is that one generation, 15 years, is not enough to destroy any kind of identity, right? People remember. The war broke out, and in order, he realized, he was very astute in terms of the power of nationalism, he realized in order to win the war, he needed to mobilize the Soviet people, and he was going to mobilize them, partly on communist ideology, partly on nationalist ideology. So he made overtures. To this national thing, and, and I actually um, look. At, uh, uh, I'll just hold on to that thought for a second. But basically, he mobilized the people based on that, and then in 1944-45, he raised the whole land issue with Turkey, which claiming Gars and Ardahan immediately after the war, uh, which he really excited the Armenians that Uncle Joe was going to going to uh, seek justice for us. But for example. Armenians also, the Armenians that were, you know, still had a sense of, you know, they were good communists, but sense of Armenianness, you use this sort of tensions and contradictions between within the Soviet Union. One of the books that I looked at was a celebration of Soviet Armenia in, published in 1945. And it had to start with a picture of Stalin and a quote from Stalin. And the quote from Stalin was about Armenian national sort of culture. And I thought Stalin would not have said this in 19... 45, right, or when, whenever it was. So I looked at the code. It was from Stalin's pronouncement in 1919 when he's trying to convince Armenians to join the Soviet Union. So Armenians were sort of manipulating things in a way. They had the code from, from Uncle Joe, but it was a code that was 25 years 
uh, earlier. So, so there was an element of both. Uh, structurally, he was never that he was powerful, but he was never that powerful to actually completely eliminate the constitutional setup of the Soviet Union.